There is nothing quite as strong or resolute as enduring or committed or caring or admirable or noble among all of humankind is the heart of a mother. What it takes to raise other human beings from birth into childhood and sometimes beyond is beyond me. Of course, fathers have a profoundly important role to play in the raising of children, but in the day in, day out, 24 seven, hands on, nonstop, selfless pouring out of oneself that is standard operating procedure for so many mothers, it amazes me. If I could find a stronger word to describe it, I would. It's endless, exhausting, often thankless work being done without fanfare recognition uh, by women all around the world every single day. And so each year we take one day, <laughs> one day out of 365 of them to publicly recognize our mothers for who they are and what they've done over the previous 364 of them. It seems insufficient to me, and indeed it is. Nevertheless, here we are. And so to all of our mothers here today, we thank you beyond words. We love you earnestly and deeply. We respect you more than you know, and we honor you for who you are and what you do every single day of the year. Can we just give all of our moms a big round of applause right now? And what I love is the fact that the heart of a mother in so many ways mirrors the heart of Christ, the, the sacrificial love for others under their care, the constant nurturing and teaching day in and day out, the protecting, the leading, the encouraging, the laying down of their own lives in so many ways so that others can live theirs to the fullest. All of those selfless qualities that can be found in the heart of a mother, we find in the heart of Christ. And so it's fitting this morning on this Mother's Day that we pause our Revelation series and take a look at the oldest passage of scripture in one of the oldest books of the Bible. It's known in antiquity as Deborah's Song, chapter 5 of the book of Judges. Easily one of the top 10 oldest books of the Bible, with this chapter again being the oldest chapter in Judges. So it's not the oldest chapter in the Bible, but it's the oldest chapter in Judges, which is one of the oldest books in the Bible. It dates all the way back to the 12th century BC. And it was written by a woman named Deborah, of course, who was the, the judge appointed by God in Israel at the time it was written. She was leading the nation, and what a woman she was. She loved God. She loved God's people, and beyond that, she was a warrior and a poet. And although we don't know whether or not she had children of her own, we do know that she identifies herself as a mother in Israel. In verse 7, as we'll see of this song, because she very clearly had the heart of a mother, for the Jewish people. And so in a very real way, she mothered the entire nation of Israel through one of the most difficult periods in their history when they needed it the most, much like Jesus himself. The 17th century scholar Johann Bengel said Jesus had no children that he might adopt all children. And so Deborah, mother to the Israelites, writes this song in response to a great victory in battle for the Israelites over the Canaanites. And what is so uh, wonderful about this particular ancient song is that it not only conveys uh, important information about an event, but it also reveals the heart of the person writing it. And, and yet beyond, the, the true beauty and power of the song goes beyond that. Because as we'll see, without Deborah knowing anything, obviously, about Jesus Christ, right? This is a long time before he showed up on the scene. This song is, is packed full of imagery and prophetic overtones of the gospel of Christ. And so as we work through this poem, we, we not only learn about the heart of Deborah and the heart of a mother, but we also learn about the heart of Christ all just by studying this one song over 1,200 years before Jesus appeared on the earth. It's, it's so important for us to understand that these Christ-like qualities we find here, uh, certainly in so many mothers today, but also in all kinds of people who follow Christ, these are qualities that originate only in Christ, which just underscores our great need for each of us to be in him and, and to be able to, to mother and to father and to mentor and to nurture and to guide and teach and to be living examples to each other as we ought to be. We have to understand the heart of Christ for this world. So that's what we're going to be looking at today as we work our way through this song of Deborah. So if you have your Bible, turn there with me. We'll put it up on the screen as well. Judges chapter 5, and we'll begin by reading the first five verses. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, 
that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. So right off the bat, Deborah is careful to recognize who to give all the glory to for what was an astounding victory in battle. 10,000 Israelites without any real weapons, as we'll see, overwhelmed 100,000 well-armed Canaanites who had a fleet of 900 iron chariots. I mean, how's that even possible? Well, in verses four and five, Deborah describes a theophany, an appearance by God, and she compares it to God's presence with his people in the wilderness at Mount Sinai where the earth trembled and God was with them in a pillar of fire and cloud. And so she says, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. So there's a violent earthquake and storm brought on uh, by God on behalf of his people. And in verses 20 and 21, Deborah says, from heaven the stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sisera, the torrent. A Kishon swept them away, the ancient torrent. Uh, the torrent Kishon. So the, the Israelites march out to war, being obedient to the word of the Lord, but it is when God shows up that things begin to happen. The earth begins to tremble, the mountains begin to shake, the clouds begin to rain down, blinding hail and water, until at its fevered pitch, the river Kishon swells into a raging torrent and sweeps away the enemy. And Deborah knew it. She knew exactly who was responsible for this miraculous victory. And so she is very careful to give all the glory and praise to the one who delivered them, the one she's devoted to, the one she loves above all others. You see, one of the reasons that Deborah was such an amazing mother to the Israelites is because she loved God. She loved God more than anything else. And look, loving God more than anything else means serving God more than everything else. And the way Deborah does that, by the way, the way that she serves God first and foremost is in the way she worships him. She writes and sings this song of praise to God for who he is and what he's done, not just because of how she feels toward him, but because of what she owes to him. But I don't think we tend to, to view worship today as our service to God. We, we think of it more as a way to express ourselves when we're feeling good toward him, our appreciation and love toward him. Of course, that, that can and should certainly be a part of it. But our worship is so much more than that. Our worship is our service to God. In fact, it's our very first service to God. We worship him before we do anything else. The Apostle Paul wrote, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That means I, you dedicate your entire life to him which is your spiritual worship, Romans 12, 1. And yet in some translations, that same verse says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why? Why does it say something different? Because the, the word worship in that verse, latria in the ancient Greek means service. Because when it comes to God, those two things are one and the same. That's, that's by the way, why the Lord's prayer begins with worship. Before we ask for anything, petition God for anything, tell him our needs, the very first thing we do is worship him because our worship to God is our very first service to God. What was the very first thing that Noah did when he got out of the ark in Genesis 8? Before he built a home for himself or his family, before starting his new life over, before making himself comfortable, before anything else, he builds an altar and worships God. Our worship to God is our very first service to God. That's why showing up and being an active part of the local church is so important for us today because it is one of the primary ways that we worship God when we gather together and sing these songs and study his word and give in the offerings. We're worshiping God as his people uh, the very first day of the week, Sunday. It's our first service to him each week to offer him our very best regardless of our status or stature or circumstances or current state of mind and yet again in the modern church we've almost made worship more about us than it is about him well i, I don't feel good today i don't want to go out in this weather i have too many other things to do this morning I don't really have the money to spare. I, I don't care for this song. I, I can't focus when I'm tired. I don't feel like being friendly. I wish more people would talk to me. I wish less people would talk to me. I'm just not feeling it today. You know, all that. 
you understand worship is not about what you feel. It's about what you owe. David worshiped God while hiding in a cave, running for his life from Saul. Daniel worshiped God under threat of execution. His three friends worshiped God as they were being thrown into an oven. Job worshiped God in the midst of the most unthinkable suffering. Paul worshiped God while chained in a Roman prison. Peter worshiped God in the middle of a life-threatening storm. John worshiped God while left to die on a remote island. And Jesus worshiped God on the eve of his own crucifixion. Why? Because they all understood that regardless of how they felt, worship was their service to God. It's what you do when you love him. This is the very heart of Christ that was on display in Deborah's heart as well. She was a great mother to the people of Israel more than anything else because she loved God more than everything else. And she showed it by worshiping him. Let's keep reading verses six through 11. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned and travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way to the sound of musicians at the watering places. There they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. So Deborah uses the first three verses in this section of the song to paint a very bleak picture, to be honest, of Hebrew life before the battle at the river Kishon. She says the highways were abandoned and, and travelers were kept to the byways. At the time this was happening, the bulk of the population of Israelites had been relegated to living in the hill country because of the Canaanite invasions. And there were main well-traveled roads that led out of the hills and down into the valleys where the Israelites would typically trade and conduct business, commerce in general. And yet their oppression had become so severe that those roads and consequently their means to making a living had been cut off by the Canaanites. And so the Jews were having to sneak their way around on these obscure and rarely used pathways that they only knew about that would wind around through the hill country between their settlements, probably under the cover of night so they could remain undetected just so they could trade between them and survive. I think it's a fascinating picture, actually, as we're studying Revelation and, and what this world system is going to do to believers and followers of Christ in the last days, that they were taking care of each other uh, almost secretly in many cases. So in what is poetic hyperbole, exaggeration, Deborah says the villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be, meaning the hill country appeared to be abandoned. Right? To someone who was unaware, the Israelites, it looked like they disappeared from the landscape altogether because they were holed up in their houses during the day, only traveling and conducting business secretly at night. So the farmers stayed out of the fields and the business people stayed off the roads to avoid being attacked by day. And certainly you can see Deborah's concern and maternal instincts in her comment, I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. Yet she doesn't, uh, doesn't stop her from assigning blame for their plight where it is due. She says, when new gods were chosen, she's talking about by the Hebrew people, then war was in the gates, was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel. So when God's people chose new gods, they adopted the gods of the Canaanites. That was when all this happened, and that is why they had to go to war without any real weapons to speak of, because they'd all been taken away from them, seized from them by the Canaanites when they started worshiping the Canaanite gods. They were overtaken by them. So Deborah simultaneously admits the faults of her own people. And yet she at the same time expresses her deep love for them as she continues. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way. So the wealthiest people among the Hebrews would ride on these uh, light-colored uh, or white female donkeys draped with lavish saddle blankets instead of the run-of-the-mill donkeys. It was kind of like the difference between a Ferrari and a Volkswagen to them. And so to ride on a white or light-colored animal was a symbol of status and stature among the rich. On the other hand, those who walked by the way was a reference to the peasant class, those who couldn't afford to ride on any colored donkey. And then finally, she includes the watering places, which were the public places where the entire community would gather. The point is, Deborah wants everyone 
every stratum of society in Israel, the rich, the poor, everyone in between, to bear witness to the mighty deeds of the Lord, not only because she loved God's people, but because she loved, I mean, loved God, but because she loved God's people as well. So out of their misery, she arose as a mother in Israel. And of course, a mother is someone who cares for, nurtures, directs the people in her care, right? It's another way of saying Deborah served the people of God because loving people means serving people. We know from chapter four that Deborah uh, used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel would come up to her for judgments, Judges 4, 5. And then when Barak, the leader of the Israelite armies, refused to go out to battle unless Deborah went with them, she said, I will surely go with you, Judges 4, 9. And then when it was time to engage the enemy in battle, Deborah had to go to Barak and guide him, push him into the fight. She said, up! There's an exclamation point there. Get up! For this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? Judges 4.14. So look, Deborah wasn't sitting under a tree all day, every day, judging the people of Israel for her health. No, she was doing that because she was a mother to them. She loved them. This prophetess didn't agree to go into battle with Barak and his troops because she thought they needed an extra sword in the fight. No, she agreed to go with them because she was a mother to them. She loved them. She, she didn't order Barak into the fight because she needed to feel powerful. No, she spoke to him like she did because she was a mother to those men who were otherwise without any guidance in their lives. She loved them. Because Deborah loved God's people. She served God's people. Listen, at the imminent risk of her own life. Because that's what it means to love other people. It means to serve them at your own risk. It means being willing to risk your own security and your own wealth and your own comfort and your own status and your own stature in service of others. That is what real love looks like. And that is what so many mothers look like, often tired, weary, worn out, stressed out, overcommitted, underappreciated, right? I, I'm pretty sure women, don't enter into motherhood for their own health. I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. Or material wealth. I mean, how many of you are getting rich on this gig? Or because it makes your life more comfortable, right? You're all just sitting around eating bonbons. No. No, moms serve other people at a price. It's actually a great price to themselves. It's a great sacrifice of themselves. Why would they do that? Because of love. It's the very heart of Christ who gave up everything for us, the same heart that we are, every single one of us, called to have for one another. If you have children, think about the way you love your own kids, right? You'd willingly give up your own life for your kids. I know that you would. But ask yourself, is that how I love my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I willing to give up my life for them? Honestly, I don't know how many people could answer that question with a yes, and yet that's exactly how Jesus loves us, and that's exactly how Deborah loved her fellow Israelites. And, and this is, by the way, not only meant to be a great story for us, it's meant to be a great example for us. This is how we're supposed to live our lives, with the heart of Christ for others beating in the chest of every child of God. I've said it many times before, you cannot have a high view of Christ and a low view of the church. And rec reconcile that scripturally, you, you can't. Jesus died for his church. People tell me all the time when they find out I'm a pastor, yeah, I love, I love Jesus. I love God. I just don't love the church. I don't love the people of God. I don't love Christians. I don't love church people. I can't stand to be around. I hear that all the time. And my, the next words out of my mouth are, you cannot have a high view of Christ and a low view of the church. If you don't love other believers, you don't love God. That's not my, that's not my words. Those are his words. You cannot claim to love Christ while despising your brothers and sisters who are in Christ. If we say we're willing to give our lives up for Jesus Christ, then we must be willing to do the same for one another. I have people who can't stand me. I want to feel that way about them, but I can't. Not if I'm going to love Jesus. I have to love them too. This is why we don't abandon our kids when they disobey. It's why we don't abandon our friends when we disagree. It's why we don't abandon our marriages when we've grown apart. It's why we don't abandon the church when it no longer suits our preferences. Not if we say we love Jesus because he didn't abandon us even though it's exactly what we deserve. See, it's all because of how he loves us. It's the very heart of Christ to lay his life down for us. And that's how we're supposed to love one another. Let's keep reading verses 12 through 23. 
Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, break out in song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinom. Then down marched the remnant of the noble, the people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their root, they marched down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen from Machir, marched down the commanders, and from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah and Issachar faithful to Barak into the valley. They rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed behind, beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Tenak by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Cursed Miraz, says the angel of the Lord, curse its inhabitants thoroughly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. And so in one quick turn, Deborah goes from expressing her deep love and compassion for the people of Israel to a stern chastisement of those very same people. And isn't that just what a mother does? Right? In, in the span of about a half an hour, there are times when I can hear my wife encourage, direct, love on, sternly discipline, and comfort the same kid. <laughs> it's part of being a mother. Because a mother loves her children enough to hold them to account when they're straying from the path they should be on. So Deborah not only continues to celebrate their great victory in this song, but she chastises the tribes who refused to come out to the battle while she's simultaneously recounting the great battle that it was as she does it all with great ferocity. Why? Because Deborah was a warrior. She says the kings came, they fought, then fought for uh, the kings of Canaan at Tenak by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver from heaven. The stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, with might. And then she goes on to describe the thundering of the horses' hooves as the chariots are stripped of their riders and the frantic and confused horses gallop away from the battlefield. You see, when the Israelites were at their lowest, cowering in fear by their oppressors, too afraid to confront them, sneaking around at night to avoid being seen without their weapons or most of their kinsmen to help them, facing the most formidable fighting force these Israelites had ever seen. Deborah was not about to back down. She was dauntless, a ruler and a fierce defender of her people, so she rose up to lead them into battle, just as a mother who will do anything to protect her children. Deborah had no qualms or hesitation whatsoever about going into the battle with Barak and his troops. In fact, she was the one pushing them into the fight. Deborah was as tough as nails because she knew she had to be for the rest of her people. And do you know that sometimes we have to fight great battles for each other as well? It's the heart of God through the prophet Ezekiel. He said, as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness, Ezekiel 34, 12. Likewise, the psalmist wrote, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked, Psalm 82, 4. You see, sometimes we have to stand up and fight for one another. It's the very heart of Christ who said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. John 10, 27 and 28. He said to Peter, If you love me, then tend my sheep. John 21, 16. In other words, Peter, take care of and protect my sheep. Jude, the brother of Jesus, wrote, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Jude 22 and 23. Look, there's too much at stake for us to not be involved in one another's lives. Life on this earth is too short for us to be concerned about what other people think about you when you reach out for help. You understand, there isn't one single person in this church who has it all together. Not one. 
There isn't one single person who doesn't struggle with some kind of sin. There isn't one single person in this family who hasn't made mistakes in their life. There isn't one of us, not one of us, who can claim to be any more deserving of the grace of God than anyone else here because there isn't one single person who deserves any of it. So let's just clear the air while we're discussing it and be really honest for a minute because you may be struggling with something in your life today and you're not sure how you're going to get through it but you're too afraid to tell anyone else because you're worried what they might think of you well first of all you're never going to make it through all the struggles you'll face in this life alone you will not Every one of us needs other people who will contend for us, who will stand up and fight at times in our lives. You cannot do it alone and you shouldn't even try. But listen, we cannot fight for each other if we cannot be honest with each other about our struggles to begin with. So how about we just, we all get over ourselves and our pride on all sides. If you're struggling, don't worry about what someone else thinks about you. Who cares? Because chances are they've been right there with you, first of all, or someplace worse. And on the other side, if someone comes to you and shares their struggles, just remember where you came from before you were rescued by Jesus Christ and other people who were there to fight for you in your darkest hour. Look, the truth is we need a lot fewer people with opinions about everything and a lot more people willing to stand up and fight for each other. Because like it or not, we need one another. We need to fight for each other. We need to have the heart of Christ toward one another, the heart of a warrior inside of us that refuses to let our brothers and sisters in this great family fight their battles alone. No one, no one should ever be fighting their battles alone. It's what it means to be the church. We risk it all for each other without hesitation or reservation because of our love for God and our love for his people. It's exactly how Deborah lived her life. She was a warrior who stood up and fought for the family of God when no one else would. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 24 to the end of the chapter. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite of tent-dwelling women, most blessed. He asked for water and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is the chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princess answer, indeed, she answers herself, have, not they found, uh, have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man, spoil of dyed materials for Sisera, spoil of dyed materials embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might, and the land had rest for 40 years." So this part of the song is recounting the demise of Sisera, who was the great mercenary warrior who fought for the king of the Canaanites against the Israelites. And you can read the whole story back in chapter 4. It's very graphic, so we won't go through all that today other than to point out the poetic and prophetic foreshadowing of the work of Christ that we find in this song. In Genesis 3.15 and Romans 16.20, we find references to the head of Satan being crushed under the feet of the seed of Eve, which is a reference, of course, to the ultimate defeat of our enemy, which we're looking at right now in Revelation in that series. And in this poem, Deborah recounts the death of Sisera in dramatic fashion, also foreshadowing the ultimate defeat of the serpent under the feet of Eve when referring to Jael and Sisera. She says she crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple between her feet. He sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. This, this is ancient poetry at its best, finding beauty where there seems to be none as Deborah, knowing or not, looks forward to the ultimate victory of Christ over death itself. And of course, the mystery and the beauty of Christ's work on the cross, the fact that in the meekness of Christ and the weakness of the cross, as gruesome as it was, our enemy was defeated That very picture is captured in the image that Deborah portrays here, the meekness of Jael. She was a Bedouin tent woman, not a warrior, but a desert-dwelling tent woman who would have been perceived at the very least as weak compared to this powerfully vaunted military leader, Sisera, a famous warrior. 
was battle, a battle-hardened enemy, and he was defeated through the meekness and perceived weakness of Jael, who was acting on behalf of God's people. You see, Deborah had the ability to see beauty where others could not, because she was a poet. The 19th century British minister and author Herbert Lockyer said the prose and poem of Judges 4 and 5 are associated with the same historic event and reveal that Deborah could not only prophesy, arouse, rule, and fight, but also write. It was said of Julius Caesar that he wrote with the same ability with which he fought. This observation can also be true of Deborah, who after her victory over the Canaanites composed a song which is regarded as one of the finest specimens of ancient Hebrew poetry being superior to the celebrated song of Miriam. Deborah was a poet, not only in the sense that she literally wrote poetry, but in the fact that she was able to see the beauty, even in the hardest parts of life. That is the essence of what poetry is all about, whether it's ever written down or not. 19th century French Impressionist Camille Pissarro once said, Blessed are those who see beautiful things in humble places where other people see nothing. 19th century Austrian poet Rainier Maria Rilke once said, if your daily life seems poor, do not blame it. Blame yourself that you're not poet enough to call forth its riches for the creator. There is no poverty. You see, there, there's poetry in all of life. It's not something we create as much as it, it is something we recognize and embrace. And Deborah, she was able to see the beauty of God's hand at work even in the harshest of circumstances, and I believe that's also evident in the heart of so many mothers, past and present, women who, in the midst of the chaos and mess and frustration and struggle of raising other human beings, are able to see the beauty in the midst of it all and even rejoice in motherhood as exhausting and frustrating and messy as it can surely be at times. This is what makes a poet a poet by the way, moms, there's no better living picture of the heart of Christ on this planet than a mother who lays her life down for her children every single day. That, in fact, is poetry in motion. And there's nothing more beautiful in the eyes of God. Okay, if, if we as God's people are going to be able to mother and to father and to mentor and to nurture and to guide and teach and be living examples of Christ as we ought to be, then we must understand the heart of Christ for this world. It's loving God more than we love anything else. It's loving his people even when we're not very lovable. It's being a warrior fighting for each other so that no one has to face their battles alone. And it's being able to find the beauty in all of it so that our worship is overflowing with joy even in the very hardest parts of life. That is the very heart of Christ and it is the poetry that God has woven into the tapestry of the lives of every single one of his children, just like the mother who weaves the beauty of her own life into her children as she raises them. That is the heart of Christ for this world. And we are meant to embrace it. Let's pray.